Good afternoon, everyone. This is Bob Dickey. I'm the president of Crown Financial Ministries, and I'm happy that you're able to spend some time with us today. This is actually the kickoff of a series that we're going to be doing uh, in this coming year, in 2015, uh, Lunch and Learn webinars throughout the course of the year, where we want to cover some topics that we feel are re relevant for uh, individuals in their personal lives and their business, just being able to provide free information of things that are, that are happening uh, in the workplace, in the business environment, or in the world around us, and how we can be uh, apprised of what's going on and how we can leverage those for the greatest benefit of, of our communities and maybe our families. So as I said, uh, I'm the president of Crown Financial Ministries, and one of the reasons why this particular topic, MOOCs, is so uh, important, I believe, uh, to everyone on this phone call, one of the reasons why we really have spent a lot of time in the last, oh, I'd say the last few months, uh, me in particular, studying this and trying to understand it, was at the beginning of the year when I started writing my new book, uh, The Leap, I sat down, I was un starting to unravel some of the things that were happening in the economy. I started uh, speaking with industry leaders, uh, chief executive officers, uh, economists, and I was, as we were watching kind of like a, a very high level of unemployment, not only here within the United States, but globally, I was ref seeing a lot of people in my life, friends, family, who were losing their jobs. Uh, and really there were three trends that were really making this happen. I was, I was noticing it was coming because of globalization, technology, and regulations. And so as I was sitting down, I was trying to understand this a little better. The, uh, a number of individuals that I spoke with were giving me some insights into what was happening. And I want to take just a, a brief moment to share with you maybe the, the things that are different in, the, in our economy today as opposed to maybe 30 or 40 years ago. So just recently in the Wall Street Journal, uh, a, a technology company called Uber received a valuation of $41.2 billion. It received uh, some of the largest investment capital uh, for a startup company. And it is taking the world by storm. It's the rage. All sorts of investors want to be a part of it. But the interesting thing about this company is it employs 1,500 people, 1,500 employees. You take a look at Facebook, major technology company here within the United States. It employs six, 7,000 people. Now, if you take a look back to the major companies that the United States had employing uh, people back in the 50s and the 60s, a company my grandfather worked for, General Motors, was the largest, most respected company within the United States. It employed millions of people. So we've got this uh, technological shift in globalization regulations that are displacing work, the workforce at a very rapid rate. And with, as I sat down and I started talking with individuals, I said, Bob, it is really important that people ha who have been displaced in this economy or people who don't want to be displaced in this economy have advanced education, that they are keeping up on education, they're studying the new forms of things that, that are happening, and, I, and it made sense to me. Problem was, I thought, boy, you know what, I'm reading in the Wall Street Journal and other publications that the cost of education are rising. Uh, a college tuition has gone up 500% since 1985. We have college graduates who are graduating with tens of thousands of dollars in debt. They can't find work. So, it, so if education is so important, but we have uh, this education problem, what can someone do who wants to have this education but doesn't have $100,000 uh, to invest in it? Or maybe a mid-career professional who doesn't have the time to take two or three years off and go get uh, an advanced degree. What are they to do? And so I sat down with a, a professor at Harvard, and I asked him a question over dinner. I said, look, what's happening in the education space? How is education being revolutionized? We're seeing technology revolutionize everything else. What's going on in the education sector? And this Harvard professor, who's been a professor there for uh, over 30 years, a senior professor at Harvard, said, Bob, I want to tell you something about MOOCs. And this was a conversation that I was having with him in January of, 20, uh, of 2014. And he, he gave me a brief story about the MOOC revolution. And MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Course. And he said, a professor at MIT wanted to run an experiment with their most 
uh, one of their most difficult courses at the university and put that course online and allow anyone in the world to register for it. This experiment, once it was posted online, shortly thereafter, over 150,000 people signed up for the course. People from all across the globe. People sat in, uh, took the course, watched the professor online, went through the exact same problems, the exact same reading, everything that, that, that those uh, prestigious students at MIT were doing on campus. When the course was over, the top scores of that class were not MIT students. The faculty was absolutely shocked. Actually, the, the top scores were from students that had been taking the class from around the world. And one of the top scores was a 15-year-old boy who had taken the course in the capital of Mongolia in Ulaanbaatar. Well, shortly thereafter, MIT reached out to that young man, offered him a full scholarship, and he is now a student at MIT. But this was a wake-up call for higher education, and all of a sudden, it started proliferating all across the United States. Right now, you can get an Ivy League education for free via these MOOCs. And that's what we're about ready to tell you about today. But I'm not the expert in this. I've just started to study it and kind of and started to dive into it. So I wanted to do some research, research and find someone who was actually a subject matter expert, an industry expert who was doing this for their own advanced education. I came across a young lady named Lori Pickard. She is our uh, guest speaker today. She is calling in from uh, Rwanda, and she's got a very interesting story. She has a, a great pedigree with her education background, but she decided, you know what, I want advanced education, but I want to get it for free, and I'm going to do it via this MOOC platform. And within the next few minutes, she is going to tell you how you can use this platform to not only advance your career, maybe help people in your life who need to reinvent themselves and, and find a, a new career, maybe they've been displaced, and also for business leaders. How can business leaders use this platform to train their employees and their staff so that they can uh, do better in the marketplace? So we're going to cover those things here in the next few minutes. We're also going to provide every single person who's on this phone call today a free ebook. We're going to email that to you, and it contains a whole host of resources and websites and things that you can go out there and you, to do, and you can start implementing some of these things in your life. And the great thing about it is it's all free. So without further ado, I would like to turn this over to Lori, and let's see if she's been able to dial in, and I'm going to pass the presenter role over to you. Uh, Lori, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I am. Is, is, can you hear me? Loud and clear. All right, so I'm going to pass uh, the, the, the presenter role over to you, and I believe uh, once you accept, you're going to be ready to go. Yep. Okay. Well, Lori, I appreciate you taking time today out of your busy schedule. I know it's late there for you to, to join, uh, join the call, and I'm sure what you have to share is going to be beneficial to everyone who's joining us. Great. Well, I'm really excited to be here, and thank you so much for your introduction. Um, so as you can see on the screen, uh, what I'm going to be presenting today is really MOOCs 101, um, really the basics of what you need to know about online learning. Um, so I'm going to give an overview of what's available in the, MOO in the MOOC world and how to get started with it, and I'm really just going to bombard you with a lot of information, and hopefully there will be plenty of time for questions at the end so we can answer all of your questions that you can write in online. So let me just start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, so I was born in St. Louis, Missouri, and that is where I grew up. I went to Oberlin College for undergrad, and I went to Temple University in Philadelphia for graduate school. I have a master's in geography. Um, but I found myself wanting more education, which I'll tell you much more about over the course of the next few minutes. Uh, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Nicaragua, and I'm currently living in Rwanda, so I've had a, quite an international Career. Um, I work in international development. I'm currently working for USAID, which is the um, American aid agency. Um, so this is my the website that I run, uh, the No Pay MBA. So this was an idea that occurred to me pretty much the first time that I heard about MOOCs. Um, I think I was not at the really early edge of adopting MOOCs. They came out really in 2011. 
and it wasn't until 2012 that they got pretty big, but I didn't hear about MOOCs until 2013. I was living in Nicaragua at that time. But my first thought, as soon as I had a friend who um, was taking a MOOC in finance, and he, he had been a business student, he had gotten an MBA, and he was taking a finance course to kind of brush up on his skills. And as soon as I heard that he was finding value in a finance course that was being offered online for free, my first thought was, this is it. This is how I can get my MBA without having to stall out my whole career and without um, having to spend money or stopping working or any of those other things. So I got started on um, this project, which was to look across all these different MOOC platforms and see what was available and uh, whether I could put together the equivalent of an MBA using just those resources that were out there. And in August of 2013, I thought there was enough to get started. And as I've gone on, there's been more and more and more. So then, um, you know, I, I started this project just thinking that I would uh, put together this portfolio to just be able to show employers. I didn't think that it would have a broader audience. But then in January of 2014, I was covered on this blog, Poets and Quants, and then that article went viral. And it was on the front page of LinkedIn for several days and got 500,000 views, and I had many people reach out to me. And that's when I really realized that there was something more here than just something that, that would be useful for just me. And that's when I really started to scale up my efforts on my website. So to date, I've probably taken about 13 or 14 courses, and I would say I'm about halfway through my program. I plan to do what I'm doing over the course of about three years, um, and I'm a year and a half in. So um, Bob already introduced the concept of a MOOC, but I want to go just a little bit deeper for those who are not familiar with what MOOCs are. So massive, they're certainly massive. Bob mentioned the very first MOOC, which had over 150,000 um, participants. The average MOOC is more kind of in the range of 20, 30, 40,000, but some MOOCs are so popular they get up to 200,000 students. So they, they truly are massive. And then open, um, these courses, are open both in the sense that they have, they're free m most of the time, although not always, and we'll talk more about that. Um, but they're certainly open to the public, and they do not require any type of admissions process. So anybody can take these courses. And then online, that's self-explanatory, as is course. Um, although one thing I want to say about courses is that these are, they're, for the most part, they're university courses, but they tend to be shorter. And, and I don't believe that the content is really condensed or, re or redacted, although in some cases it is. Um, but for the most part, I think that students are getting the full content, but it takes a little bit less time because all you're getting is the, the professor's, um, what the professor considers to be most important. And you're not getting you know, attendance taking. You're not getting discussion. You're not getting any of those other components of a, of a live course. But you do get most of, if not all, of the content. And nowadays, there are more in the kind of MOOC space. You're not just getting university courses. You're also getting um, providers that are providing um, very tailored or very targeted um, courses on very particular skill sets. So they're not always in university courses, though often, most of the time, when somebody says MOOC, what they mean is a university course. So I want to just go through some of the ways that you learn in a MOOC. Um, they've gotten more and more dynamic over time. But the bread and butter of a MOOC is the video lecture. So you get a professor speaking. And sometimes it's in front of a PowerPoint slide, or you get the slides and the, and the voiceover, and it maybe switches back and forth. You also have discussion forums where students can bring up issues. They can talk together. They can ask questions of a professor or a moderator or a TA if there is a teaching assistant for the course, which there usually is. Uh, you get quizzes, online quizzes and tests. Sometimes, and I love these, you, when you get problem sets, um, they're usually difficult, they're challenging, and that's where you can really see that you're learning something new, um, especially in math-based courses. And then often there are also live web sessions that students can phone into just like we're doing right now. Um, so the MOOC providers, so Coursera, Udacity, and edX are the, the, the big three, the first three MOOC providers, but there are now many more. Um, some that are based overseas. Um, Iversity is one of those. Um, Open to Study is an Australian one, and, and they're, they're really based all over the place. There's even now an Arabic-only um, MOOC provider. There's a Chinese MOOC provider as well. Um, and also, there are some MOOC providers like Code Academy and Google that focus much more on coding. That's a really an emergent area in MOOCs, coding and programming. And then just 
idea of which universities are part of this, uh, which, which universities have these platforms have attracted. It's many of the major universities, uh, Stanford, Emory, Brown. Um, this is just for Coursera. These are some from edX. And again, this is a small portion of uh, the universities that are part of creating and, and giving away MOOCs. So what can you learn via MOOC? Um, this is just a word cloud of uh, some of the different subjects that you can learn in a MOOC. And again, this is a small selection. And the size of the words is not representative of how many courses. Uh, it's really just to give you an idea of how much there is out there. Practically any subject that you could type into a search bar, you can find via MOOC. So I want to talk about kind of where MOOCs are in their life cycle and what we can expect from the future. So I want to talk about something called the Gartner Hype Cycle, which basically covers the way that a technology sort of moves it through its maturity. And as you can see on the lower axis is maturity across time, and on the y-axis is visibility. So you've got some type of trigger. In this case, it was the launch of three courses by Stanford. Um, and, and of course, the course by MIT that Bob mentioned. So that in those three courses by Stanford were really the first time that um, MOOCs were getting a lot of press and many people were able to join. Then by 2012, the New York Times was calling 2012 the year of the MOOC. And you've got this picture here of a person taking a chainsaw to traditional higher education. The MOOC was going to destroy all of regular higher education and replace it with something new. Um, and it was the year of the MOOC. So then by 2013, 2014, you were getting people saying that this was really a revolution that wasn't, and maybe MOOCs were really a failure after all. So now the question for us is, are MOOCs going to move into this latter half of this curve, the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity? Are we going to see that MOOCs are going to actually create some type of lasting change and that they will provide a productive um, solution to some of the problems in higher education? And I believe that the answer is yes. So let me tell you about who I think can benefit from online learning in its present form and also what we can expect to see in the future, just in a really brief overview. So I think that MOOCs can have great benefits for students, for mid-career professionals, and also for employers. So for students, I think MOOCs can already be a great supplement to coursework. There's plenty of chance to get additional help, to watch additional lectures, to do additional problems, to have just a supplement to the coursework that you're already doing. I also think that it's quite possible that MOOCs may one day offer credit towards graduation. So all those courses that people are taking, it's very possible that you could take Intro to English Literature, or that you could take Calc 1, or that you could take some of these courses via MOOC and then get credit for them. And that's already happening in a limited way in some university systems. Again, for mid-career professionals, I think that MOOCs can already enhance somebody's career skills. And I'm certainly a living testament to that. I can see that my um, skills have greatly increased since I started taking business courses. It's something that I can feel. There are types of financial analysis that I now use in my work that I wasn't able to do before I started doing um, these courses. And also, the, uh, having gotten a lot of more familiarity with the language of business and many business concepts has really helped me in my work, even though I work in a field that isn't um, typically aligned with business. We're moving more in that direction, and that's really helped me. Now, I also think there's a great possibility that we will probably one day see professional qualifications that are recognized by employers that a uh, mid-career professional is able to get via MOOC. And finally, for employers, um, I think that MOOCs are already a very cost-effective way to train employees. I mean, these courses are free. Oh, sorry. Oh. Lost the presentation. Here we go. Um, so these courses are free, so they're clearly a very effective, cost-effective way to train employees. And the subjects are um, so wide-ranging that I, I think it's um, pretty likely that somebody could find, an employer could find what they would like to use to train their employees in MOOCs. Um, I also think that MOOCs have great potential for recruitment of, can recruitment of candidates, either via the training that already exists to use those courses to select um, very high potential candidates, and also when employers are able to create um, very specific training platforms that they can then offer via MOOC, that can also be a great way to identify really promising candidates. OK, so I hope I've convinced you that this is something that you should be considering. 
either for your own education, for your kids' education, um, for, or if you're an employer, for your employee training. So how do you get started? So I think any of these, web, any of these platforms for MOOCs, if you go onto them, they'll have something like this. What do you want to learn today? You can type something into the search bar, and many courses will come up. Um, you may not want to do that across every MOOC platform that's out there. So I would suggest going to one of the MOOC aggregators that I'm going to present. There are three of them here. These are three of the bigger ones, Skilled Up, Slide Rule, and Course Talk. And they all function basically the same way. They pull um, MOOC offerings from across different platforms. They also provide reviews. Um, and they can really give you kind of a, a really good picture of what's out there in whatever field um, you're looking to study. Uh, also, increasingly, these providers are grouping courses into series of courses, which I, I also think is a very promising development since a one-off course in a, in a certain subject probably won't substantially advance um, somebody's skill base. However, a series of courses really can do that. Um, so one of the ways that this is happening is the MOOC aggregators and sometimes the MOOC providers themselves are providing these series of courses and saying, okay, if you study all these courses, you'll be an expert in Android app development or social entrepreneurship, or in the, the case on the right here, MBA Essentials, which is, um, this is a learning path that I collaborated on with um, the MOOC aggregator slide rule to come up with this one. Another promising development, which I think anybody who's interested in MOOC should be aware of, is uh, nano degrees, which were created by Udacity. So this is something that they're developing um, in coordination with businesses. So the first partnership is with AT&T. But basically, this is a, um, a degree. It's a, na a nano degree, a tiny degree, that then prepares a person to work for the company, for AT&T in this case. But there are others as well. So it gives them a type of preparation that's really tailored towards working in that field. And students pay for these degrees, but they pay a fraction of what they would pay in a typical college program. And the matchup between what they learn and what they'll apply on the job is almost 100%, which you can't really say that about a typical um, advanced degree or a typical higher education. And then Coursera is offering something that they're calling specializations, where they have sequences of courses in a particular field. They have data science, and they have a couple of others. And edX also has a similar program. So should you pay for courses? Um, I think this is an interesting question, and that's why I wanted to cover it in a little bit of depth, um, since there, it is possible to pay for courses. But many of the courses are free. So the question is, should you be paying for any of this? Um, and there are certain things you could pay for. You could pay for content. You could pay for certification or verification of that you've actually done this course of study. You can pay for a series of courses, um, either for the content itself or for the certification of that series of courses. And some of the ways that you can do that, um, for example, Udemy and Linda are new platforms that are paid. So almost all of their content, they have some free content, but for the most part, you would pay for the courses themselves. Um, Udacity courses as well. They used to be free. They are no longer, except for some of them. Um, Coursera offers a verified statement of accomplishment, which you pay for. edX also offers a verified certificate. Udacity has, as I mentioned, these nano degrees, which are fall in this kind of series of course groupings, as well as edX has a uh, series and Coursera has their specialization. Let me just give you a sense of how much some of these things cost. So for Udemy and Linda, you could pay anywhere from five to five, five, excuse me, fifty to five hundred dollars per course. Um, with Udemy, twenty five dollars per month. With Linda, Udacity is $200 per month. A Coursera verified statement of accomplishment will cost you around $50. An edX verified certificate is on a sliding scale, where it's by basically donation, but minimum donation of $25. The Udacity Nano degree is the same as regular courses, $200 per month, and you just work your way through at your own pace. Um, the edX series is $275 for the entire series. And the Coursera specializations, you pay by the course. It's about $30 per course. But then once you paid for all of them, then you get the certificate for the entire specialization. So all these websites are setting this up really differently. Um, but as you can see, it's still a fraction of the cost of a regular university degree. Um, so my feeling is, in general, um, I'm not opposed to paying for courses, although I haven't done it myself. And the reason that I haven't done it is because I found 
pretty much everything that I need for free. So I'm prepared to pay at the point that I find that I can't get what I need um, without having to pay for it. I'm willing to pay. And some of the things that I think might be really worth paying for would be um, very targeted uh, trainings on things like you know, how to use Excel or programming or really focused um, skills. And, the, and that you could typically find through platforms like Udemy and Linda. The other thing that I think people are increasingly beginning to pay for, and this is, a pretty, this is pretty new in the realm of things you can pay for with MOOCs, and that would be motivation, motivational services. And there are several providers offering this service, including SlideRoll, which is one of the aggregators, and they're offering it across any courses that somebody would want it for. And also the coding site, Thinkful, they're offering kind of these accompanied courses where if you're wanting to learn how to code, but that's difficult for you, or you're worried about it, you can have somebody who will check in with you and kind of hold your hand through it. And this is also something that I'm beginning to offer coaching services um, through my website, so it's also something that I'm kind of dipping a toe into this area as well. And I wanted to dive in just a little bit on whether you should pay for a verified certificate since anyone who uses an edX or a Coursera who signs up for one of those courses will be asked, do you want to earn a verified certificate? Uh, so this is what a regular certificate looks like. And this is what a verified certificate looks like. So there, there are some subtle differences. Um, the verified certificate does look a little bit nicer, and it has a seal on it. Um, the main difference in terms of what you're actually paying for is that with a verified certificate, there's an identity verification process. So it, you get the same content. Um, the work is the same. The grading is the same. But what you're paying for is every time you log in, a picture is taken of your face and they register your typing pattern to make sure that it's always the same person logging in again and again. So part of the reason that I've chosen not to pay for one of these verified certificates is that I don't see, in terms of verification, I don't know that it will make that much of a difference for me going forward. I have heard people say that they find that when they pay something for the course, their level of motivation goes up. So I think there could be a great value to paying for these, sort of, for these uh, verified certificates as a way of increasing motivation. And um, also I think it could um, be a way to support these platforms. So if you believe in what they're doing and want to support them a little bit, this could be a way to help them. Finally, uh, presenting your online learning. So once you've done all this coursework, then what do you do with it? This is the question I get asked. Um, fairly often about how do I put this on my resume. And uh, I think my answer to that is that it should be really probably different for every person how they end up wanting to present this. But my general suggestion would be to try to group courses into some type of package rather than just listing course by course, I did this and I did that. It really, I think, helps to frame it. If you can say, I did a series of courses that were all related to data science or all related to business or related to entrepreneurship, that kind of puts you in a, in a um, position of having gained some type of expertise rather than being a dabbler in, in many different areas, which MOOCs are also great for. But in terms of career advancement, I think having a package of courses is much more valuable. And you can get that either by doing your own package of courses or by putting one of these series of courses on your resume. You can also uh, present your coursework on LinkedIn. Um, this is the free version of what you can present if you've just done the course without paying for a verified certificate. Um, one of the benefits of paying for a certificate if you choose to do that is that you can get a badge on your profile rather than just this line. It looks a little bit nicer. And then finally, um, and there's an increasing movement towards having portfolios online that, are, that go farther than just saying, this is what I did and, and saying it. You can actually show it using a website like Accredible, and there are several others. But you can put your course project, you can upload your certificates, but you can also include the work that you did as part of the course. If somebody wants to really dig in to what you've done, you can demonstrate your skills with the products of your work. Okay, so let me just give you a little bit on the coaching and consulting services that I offer. Um, and, I, and this is something that's very new on my website, so I'm very happy to hear from people about whether you think this would be valuable, if you think that this is an offering that maybe isn't valuable, or if there's a service that you'd like to see that isn't here. I'm very uh, interested to hear from people about this, since it is new for me. So some of the things that I'm planning to offer, um, coaching for individuals, um, how to use online training to meet your career goals how to keep motivated and stay on track, and I'm um, offering a service where I'll check in with you to make sure that you're 
um, held accountable for what you said you're going to do, and how to present your coursework on your resume and social media. And then for businesses, to help develop employee training programs, and also to monitor and assess the outcomes of those training programs. So as I said, I'm very interested in hearing from people whether you're interested in pursuing these services or if you just have some ideas for me, I'm very happy to hear from you. And uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, so I'd love to take some questions. Let me hand it back to you, Bob. Lori, thanks for the presentation. And for everyone who's joining us, we are going to be opening this up for a, a little a Q&A uh, here in just a moment. And let me just pull my screen back open. Let's see here. Share window. All right, here we go. So, in conclusion, uh, for those of you who would like to ask Lori a question, or myself, although Lori is the expert in this area, uh, you can type it in the little text bar. Uh, Amy, where where should they type that? There's a little chat box at the top of your toolbar, you should see. If you click on that little call out sign, you should be able to send a message to the entire group or to Bob or Lori directly. Yeah, so in just a minute or two, we will start taking those, those questions and Lori and I can uh, answer those for you. So in conclusion, I think you can see now why uh, I have been so excited about this. It was actually a, a really important aspect of the book that I wrote. Uh, I feel like advancing uh, your education and staying on top of what you're doing in your, in your career is absolutely critical. Uh, I had multiple professors that I interviewed over the course of this last year that said, Bob, really a college degree today has a shelf life of about three years. You, you have to view it like milk. If you leave milk out on the counter, uh, if, it, it's going to eventually spoil. He said technology and the economy and things are changing so rapidly that when a college graduate leaves their university with their degree, the things that they learned in that degree program, within three, four years, many of them are going to be obsolete. So they constantly have to be refreshing themselves and staying abreast of what's happening, you know, taking refresher courses. And so for for those of us who have been in the workplace for many years, if it's been – you know, 5, 10, 15 years since we've been in a classroom environment, this is a great way for us to stay fresh, to be, you know, tracking what's going on and making sure that we're up to date in all of our, our learning and advancement. This is the ebook that we're going to be sending out uh, for everyone. Uh, you should be getting this in your uh, via email later today. It's about 20 pages, I believe, of a whole bunch of uh, in-depth information. It has Lori's contact information and her website in there. It has all of those various MOOC aggregators and places you can go and things that you can do uh, to start this educational process, like Lori said, either for your children, for yourself personally, or maybe if you want to start developing some advanced education and uh, on-the-job training for your place of work. You know, one of the things that uh, Crown has done, you know, we have uh, adopted this um, lock, stock, and barrel. I mean, it, we are in over 80 nations around the world trying to disseminate information in the old, with the old economy, the old method of printing and uh, warehousing and distribution of materials uh, all across the globe can be quite cumbersome. But with these MOOCs, with these various aggregators, we've been able to load up almost all of our coursework into Udemy and people have now uh, have access to this in multiple languages all across the world via their internet or their handheld device. So it makes it extremely easy for us to be able to move information and content around. So you can even find a lot of our stuff out there uh, on these MOOCs. So here's our contact information for those of you who would like to email Lori and stay in touch with her, find out about her awesome work there in Africa and also what she's doing with uh, this particular program, the No Pay MBA. Uh, there's her email and also her website address. Uh, I also have those links on my personal website, uh, and they are, will be included in the MOOC book that you receive here shortly. Uh, here's my contact information. Uh, I'm doing a lot of writing on this and the various things that are uh, changing in the economy, 
how people can be prepared. And you can uh, follow that on my website, robertldickey.com. And then, of course, if you'd like to find out what uh, Crown is doing uh, in the future, there's our website. And we're going to be holding these Lunch and Learn webinars throughout the course of the year, uh, trying to bring uh, pertinent information uh, to those people out there that you can apply uh, in your daily lives. So without any further ado, what I'd like to do is open it up for any uh, questions. And it looks like we have a few there. So I'm going to click on this chat bar and uh, see what we, uh, what, what's there. So here's one. Which of the courses, if any, will transfer to a traditional college degree? That's a great question. Uh, and the second one, if I have an associate's degree, is there a pathway to a bachelor's degree through MOOCs? So, Lori, I'm going to uh, allow you to uh, start off with both of those. Sure, and this is, this is a great question. Um, so to answer your first question, which of the courses, if any, will transfer to a traditional college degree, currently this isn't being done by the course. So it's not as though there are certain courses that come with credit and others that don't. It's really more by the university. So I think it's in, I believe it's the University of Florida system that has, um, that has said that they would like to move aggressively into offering credit for MOOCs. I'm not sure if they've actually put that into practice. Um, but that would be up to each individual university system to determine which courses they might take, how they'll value them in terms of credit, and what you would need to do in order to get credit for those courses. Um, and for the second question, at, at the moment, the answer is no. There, there is no pathway currently from an associate's degree to a bachelor's degree by a MOOC. However, I truly believe that it is only a matter of time before um, some of these offerings are available. And this is something that people want, um, and it's certainly possible with the technology. So I, I think it's really just a matter of time until there is a way to actually earn a bachelor's degree via MOOC. Lori, what would you recommend as a first step for someone who's interested in kind of dipping their toe in the water, so to speak, and, and, and exploring this? I mean, you've, uh, you've done this. You've kind of, you're, you're well down the path, so to speak. Um, so what would be the, your recommended first um, I would say the first thing would be to just check in and, with yourself and see what is it that I really want to learn. Um, and then once you have the answer to that question, I would just type it into a search bar on any of these platforms. And I'd probably do it on one of the aggregator sites just to see the universe of what's out there, and then just take a course. It's free. You really don't lose anything by signing up for a course. Um, so I would just check one out and see, see how it goes. I can tell you the experience that I've had with MOOCs. I, um, I'm mentoring a, a young gentleman who just recently graduated from a master's program at the London School of Business. He's back here in Knoxville. And, you know, so he has a very uh, a, a pedigreed education, but he felt like he wasn't quite prepared uh, in the area of finance. And he went out to uh, the, the, these MOOC aggregators and decided to take a finance course at the University of Michigan. It's one of the courses they teach in their MBA program. And mm -hmm. he, this, this young man is very discerning in terms of uh, – uh, what he does, and his experience in this class has been unbelievable. It's like, Bob, it is, I can't believe how hard it is, but I love it. You know, I get access to the teachers. I'm able to communicate with other students. I'm learning so much. So he has found this to be an enormously positive experience, and he's already planning on what his next courses are going to be. So he sees this as a, a great supplement to the uh, advanced education he's already received. So uh, another question that uh, has has been uh, posted is, which platform can I use to get certification in a specific area of business that would be recognized by Canada? Do you have uh, an answer for that one, Lori? No, I don't. And I, I think it would probably be the same as the answer for um, here in the United States, which platforms would be most recognized. I think this is really still such a new area that there isn't, there isn't yet broad recognition by businesses of, of this type of education. It's really so new and nobody's figured out yet you know, how we're going to value it in the marketplace. Um, so I, would focus, um, I wouldn't focus yet on certification. I think this is coming. The certification um, degrees, uh, things that you can kind of a piece of paper that you can take to somebody and say, hey, I did this and it's valuable, that's not, that's not here yet. Um, there are certificates that will say, I completed this course, but somebody might ask you, well, so what? It's not a degree. Why is it valuable? And you would have to make that case. 
So I think really the, the real value that these courses are offering at the moment is for personal development. So if you have a skill set that you know would be valuable for you in your work or in your personal life, you can get that skill set and you can do it online. That's absolutely possible. And, and I think the story that you just told about this person who already had an advanced degree and wanted to increase what he already knew and use it for personal development and professional development um, that he was designing, that really works. And that's exactly what I'm doing as well. And it's, um, I can tell you it far exceeded my expectations of what was possible online. However, if what you need is that piece of paper, if you need the degree that's the signal, it's not the content, it's the signal that says you did this and you have that brand of whatever institution that you got it from and you truly need that in order to get ahead, MOOCs are not for you yet, but they may be in the future. So it's probably worth checking it out now to see what's out there, because in the future, I think these will be these offerings will be there. That, that's a great answer, and I think it answers the question uh, this viewer wrote in, how about earning a master's degree from a bachelor's through the MOOC? So I think you've answered that quite well. You know, one of the things that I've noticed is that um, – in, in the economy right now, we are quickly moving towards a meritocracy. And what I mean by that is I had the opportunity to sit next to a young young man on a flight recently. We were flying back from Seattle. Uh, he, he's a senior at Duke University, and he is uh, in the computer science, computer science major, and he had just finished up an interview with Microsoft. Uh, he had an offer in hand from Amazon, and he had interviewed with Facebook. So – this this guy is top of his class, extremely brilliant. And I asked him, what was it like when you were interviewing for these companies? Because those are three of the top companies that a lot of people in your field would like to work for. He said, Bob, yeah, I think you know me having a degree from Duke uh, helped open the door. But he said, honestly, when I sat in the, all three of those interviews, they could have cared less where I graduated from. Uh, I walked into a room. There were multiple people sitting at a table, and there was a whiteboard in front of me. And they asked me a series of questions of how would you program this? How would you do this? And I was expected to go to that whiteboard and uh, annotate, start drawing it out, start putting my work on the board in front of them. And they were testing my thought patterns and my logic to see if I could actually do what I have been telling them I could do. And I, I, what I'm seeing is more and more of that in, in our economy. Uh, you know, the old economy, you absolutely had to have a degree as to, to open that door. But I think um, there are uh, places within the economy where, where employers are saying, you know what, uh, I want to make sure that you know how to do this, and it's the skill set and the knowledge that's most important for me, not necessarily the degree that you have. So especially within the IT sector, I'm, uh, I'm specifically seeing that within the IT sector. If you, and there's a lot of uh, uh, platforms out there. Refactor U uh, is one that I would highly recommend that if you want to learn coding and programming, you can do a deep dive and get a great proficiency on that. Um, and I, I'm seeing people get picked up with no computer science formal education, but they're doing this via MOOCs. Uh, and the, right, right now, the, the unemployment rate uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, for someone with a technology degree is 0.3%. There's just not enough people with that type of background. So I won't go into all of that now, but just a thought I would share that with the audience. Um, let's see. Which platform can I use? Oh, it looks like we've already that question's already been asked and answered. It doesn't look like there's any other... Uh, questions right now. Lori, is there anything in particular that maybe you would like to highlight uh, as we finish up? If, if we don't have any more questions, we'll go ahead and um, uh, end the call here in just a second. But I thought I'd give you the opportunity to maybe uh, add another point or two, or, or is there something that you would like to reference? Um, actually, it looks like we just did get one other question, and I'm really glad that we're getting as I'm just scanning it. I haven't even finished reading it yet. But um, this person is bringing up entrepreneurship. So let me just read out the question. I wouldn't need the paper certification, just the knowledge, but I'm wondering how to know what courses would be the most suited to your needs, i.e., I am looking to start a side business but have very little business knowledge. I'm certain some courses would be beyond what I would need, whereas others would be helpful for a new entrepreneur. I wouldn't really know exactly what I need to know, um, and I'm wondering if there is a resource for helping to figure that out. So I'm so glad um, that Julie asked this question because I think this is actually one of the areas, especially in the business, in the field of business, that MOOCs are just so Im immensely valuable. And if you think about 
what you need to get a business, to have a career in business. It's a really different answer if you're looking for a job to be employed by somebody versus if you're looking to be an entrepreneur. And honestly, if you're trying to start your own business, you don't want to go deeply into debt before you're about to start a business, which may also require you to go into debt to get started on that business. You want to get started right away, and you want to pick up just those skills that you're going to need in your own business. Um, there are plenty of courses out there on entrepreneurship, and I'll give you just a few of the ones that I think are probably the best value that will really give you kind of the orientation that you need to get started. Um, the one I would recommend most highly would be How to Build a Startup. It's called How to Build a Startup. It's Steve Blank. It's on um, Udacity's platform, and it's actually still free. It's one of their few free courses, and it's fantastic. Um, I would also recommend on edX, they have two courses on entrepreneurship, both of which are starting in January, and I'm registered for both of them. I haven't taken either yet, but I have heard great things about them, and it's Entrepreneurship 101 and Entrepreneurship 102. So it's who is my customer and what can I do for my customer. Uh, so I would, I would highly recommend those. And then, Julie, as you keep going with uh, what you're studying, I think you may also find that you'll want to take at least one course on finance and maybe one on accounting, just so that you have some background so that you know what it is that you need to do to set up your business. And you may still end up needing to have somebody who's more of a specialist in accounting, especially. Um, but I think just knowing what those fields are all about and what needs to be done in order to run a business in terms of finance and accounting could be extremely valuable for you. That's an excellent answer. And there's also another one that just came in while you were uh, speaking. Uh, this one says, or, or asks, which providers have you found give the best quality courses? I assume that some providers have better courses in some areas than others. What have you found? I've actually found that all the MOOCs that I've taken have been extraordinarily high quality. I mean, really surpassing my expectations um, and just in terms of the production and in terms of how they're structured. I'm a big fan of Coursera because I find their platform to be very kind of user-friendly and really easy to understand right off the bat. Um, I also like edX's platform, but I found they have, um, they do their videos in really short segments. So they'll do like a two-minute video followed by a question, followed by another two-minute video and another question. And um, sometimes I find that that format is kind of breaking things up for me. Um, I prefer longer videos, but I think it's a matter of preference. Um, I wouldn't say that there's any platform that I, found, that I find that doesn't have high quality courses. I think it's really just a matter of what you're looking for. Um, and Coursera, I would say, of all the platforms, has probably the most um, academic type courses. edX has really math heavy courses in my um, experience. And then um, some of the other platforms have, uh, when I haven't liked a course, it's generally because it's at such a surface level that I don't feel like I got any new professional level knowledge. Um, but I wouldn't say that that's more true from, from, from one platform to another. It's really course by course. Lori, we have another question here from Hugo. Uh, any thoughts on providing content in other languages? Uh, you know, so Hugo, I, 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 I'll tell you from a Crown perspective, we are loading up content um, on these MOOCs in multiple languages, and we're uh, leveraging our partners around the globe to help us translate a lot of that content. Uh, so that's something that we're doing. But uh, Lori, what are, what are you finding with some of these other courses from various universities uh, are they there in multiple languages for people? Yes, um, they are. And this, I think this is a great question as well. And it also really highlights the global nature of MOOCs. Um, so you can currently find a lot of classes in Spanish and a, a lot of classes in French as well. Um, so, so those are certainly available. Um, some other languages, as I said, there's now an Arabic platform. And I believe there are some classes you can find in Chinese as well. Um, I think it's a great opportunity if you speak a, a foreign language at a level where you can follow along with a class, it can be a great experience to try to get that professional level content in a foreign language. And you can also, on some courses, you can slow down the professor so that they're, they're speaking more slowly. You can add subtitles. So it can also be a great help for language learning. And I certainly found, you know, I, I work in Africa, and um, I facilitated a MOOC recently where it wasn't my content, it was the MOOC content, but I facilitated at the U.S. Embassy in Rwanda a class that was open. It was on entrepreneurship, and it was for Rwandan students. And um, it was really interesting 
seeing them kind of, they're, none of them have English as a first language, none of, nobody in my class, but they all had a, a pretty high level of, of English. And so just to see them kind of uh, work their way through the course material, to see which tools they found really helpful, to see um, what they needed to do in order to process uh, this content that was really high level content but in a foreign language was really, really interesting. Another question that came in, let's see. I'm going to scroll back up to the one that was answered a, uh, or asked a uh, second ago. I'm interested in being a financial coach as a business. Do you have any platform recommendations? Should I take bookkeeping also to complement it? And, and this is one that I could probably give a little bit of uh, insight here, sure. and then also potentially offline. So there are certain uh, courses and things that uh, we offer at Crown, depending on where what direction you're wanting to go. Uh, but I would be more than happy to speak with uh, this individual offline. Just email me, and I can provide uh, some various courses and, and, and different content that I'm aware of. Uh, we have another uh, question. Let's see, are there courses offered with captions via Coursera? You can search for uh, specific languages on their website, Chinese, Turkish, French. Um, so... Yeah, this is a really good point that many of the courses, even if they're not offered in more than one language, the videos will often come with captions. In fact, the one of the courses that I took, the professor ended up developing a real relationship with a whole group of students that was taking the course from Greek and or from Greece, excuse me. And so in a subsequent offering of the course, he offered all the videos with Greek subtitles that that group of students had put together specifically for that course. That's great. I, I'm uh, impressed with all the various questions that uh, have been submitted. Uh, I want to be mindful of everyone's time because I know we're coming up on the hour and many of you are calling in on, uh, you know, at work or on your lunch break. One of the things that I would like to, um, to offer is this ebook that we are sending you. Feel free to share that with friends or family, uh, people that you know who uh, might need that information. Uh, once again, Amy has offered to be able to uh, talk with individuals and answer questions, and uh, she is a great resource for you to reach out and contact. Uh, I will be more than happy to share any information that I have and uh, communicate with you guys as well, so you have my contact information there. We will also, since this call was recorded, we are also going to post it on the Crown Business website. So if you know of friends and family who might be interested in this information and weren't able to join, uh, we'll submit the link to you. and You can uh, have them go out there and, and listen to this, and hopefully it will be an encouragement to them. So uh, I think right now what we'll do is go ahead and close out the call. Lori, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to have multiple phone calls with me. I know our geographies are, are different and uh, the time zones, and you have been just a joy to work with. I look forward to building a, a stronger relationship with you uh, in the coming months, and I know that your uh, information and your perspective are, is going to help a lot of people. So I just want to say thank you. And uh, if there's anything that we can ever do for you, please don't hesitate to reach out and contact us. And that, that offer goes to everyone else who's listening on the phone call. Well, thank you so much as well. It really has been a pleasure working with you. And I, I look forward to connecting with some of the people who are in the webinar offline uh, at a later date. So thank you so much. All right. Well, guys, have a great afternoon. Uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. If I don't get the ch a chance to chat with you personally, we hope that you have a wonderful 2015. We hope that you'll come back in the future for more of our Lunch and Learn webinars. So take care, guys.